I would now like to pass it over to our speaker, Dr. Arthurine Zakama, the founder of A to Z Medical Excellence Scholarship and a first year maternal fatal medicine fellow. Take it away. Thanks so much for being here with us today. Wonderful. Hi, everyone. Um, I know I can't see all of you, but I see that there are 130 people here, which is amazing. It's a great turnout. Um, so I am um, Arthurine Zakama. I am a first year MFM fellow at Penn. And honestly, I was not always a great test taker. Um, I think I've learned so much about taking these standardized tests from my ACT to um, written uh written boards in um, in June. And so I just really want to share my tips and tricks with you all. Um, and then I also wanted you all to have a fireplace because <laughs> it is the holidays to bring you a little holiday chair. Okay. So we'll start off with um, the with three questions and I'll just walk you through. I'll read it out loud. So please participate in the chat. Um, and uh, Marissa, I'll just have you read out things from the chat because um, when I'm in the next link, I won't be able to see the chat, okay? Perfect, that sounds great. All right, wonderful. Just give me one second. Perfect. All right, can everyone see the question? There's three. All right, yes? Marissa, can you see it? Is it shared properly? Yep, Perfect. you're good to go. Wonderful. So the first question, um, a 25-year-old P0 um, woman at 31 weeks gestational age presents to labor and delivery for preterm labor. Um, she has not, um, she has had no complications with this pregnancy other than a UTI treated in early pregnancy. She is admitted um, with cervical dilation of seven, of oh, sorry, three centimeters and 75% effacement. She is contracting every three to four minutes and is at an increased risk of preterm delivery. Administration of which of the following medications can improve neonatal respiratory distress? I'm just going to pause there um, because this type of question is a very, um, it's not multiple steps. They're not, it's not a few jumps before in terms of the answer prompt, um, in terms of the question prompt rather. And so this is a question that is, um, you should be able to answer just by, um, um, just by seeing that she's preterm and then a medication that would improve neonatal respiratory distress. Um, so, uh, what are some of the, all right. And then feel free to put your answers in the chat, um, from what you're seeing here. So your, your answer options are antenatal corticosteroids, antibiotics, lactated ringers, methogen, or terbutaline. Um, what comes first to your mind when you think about preterm, um, you know, risk of preterm, um, labor? risk of preterm birth and a medication that would improve neonatal respiratory distress for a premature infant. So we've got a vote in for A so far. Okay, perfect. Um, so antenatal corticosteroids is the answer. We'll push that, show explanation. And um, as I take you through the tutor, this, um, these questions, it also demonstrates to you how the TrueLearn software works. Um, and for me, when I um, study um, with TrueLearn, I show the answers. So, um, and I always take it in tutor mode. Um, it also tells you what percent of users answer this correctly. Um, and this is my favorite part, y'all. Like, whether I get a question right or wrong, I always force myself to read the entire text. So, um, because this is how you learn as you're doing the questions. So it says here, and this is also information that learning it in this question could help you for another question. Um, so, um, as we know, um, the administration of antenatal corticosteroids um, to women at risk of um, imminent preterm birth is strongly associated with decreased um, neonatal morbidity and mortality. And how that occurs is that it decreases um, the relative risk of um, respiratory distress 
uh, syndrome, intracranial hemorrhage, necrotizing enterocolitis, as well as neonatal death. Um, and then, so, uh, so then when you go through what these other answer, what these other potential answers were, it tells you why they're not correct. And that, um, and that's especially important if, you know, you answered a question correctly, but you didn't feel confident in, um, in the answer that you chose. This is a way for you to learn the information and really strengthen um, your knowledge base in relation to why the answer um, you chose was correct. Um, and so, um, you know, that into antibiotics are an intervention for pre um, preterm premature rupture of membranes. Lactated ringers can help provide hydration to decrease the frequency of maternal contractions. Methogen um, is used for uh, maternal bleeding that's, um, that's due to uterine atony, is a uterotonic. And then terbutaline decreases maternal contractions, which we often use um, in the setting of, of intrapartum um, intrapartum decelerations due to um, frequent contractions, okay? And then this bottom line um, also is kind of the too long didn't read <laughs> um, that I love about TrueLearn. So this bottom line, um, you know, if you're especially, you know, crunch time. I know in residency, it's hard to find time to study. And so this bottom line is really your big takeaway. Um, and then it also gives you links to information, um, to, you know, the ACOG committee opinion, as well as where you can find in a textbook to expand your knowledge. All right, we'll do the next question. All right. A 17-year-old um, girl is diagnosed with stage two ovarian cancer and undergoes surgical staging with pathology consistent with a malignant germ cell tumor. She is going to receive chemotherapy with IV bleomycin sulfate, etoposide phosphate, and cisplatin, or BEP. Um, what is the most common and potentially dose-limiting side effect of cisplatin therapy? A, cardiotoxicity. B, um, hemorrhagic cystitis, C, nephrotoxicity, D, pulmonary toxicity, or E, secondary leukemia. What do y'all think? We've got the poll posted. If everybody wants to go in and select what they think the answer will be, and we can give you guys all a second, and we'll dive right into the answer. All right, so, so far we have C. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, perfect. So we'll go with C, drum roll. <laughs> Wonderful, that is correct. You may remember from your chemo man or chemo woman that um, cisplatin was one of the C's that made up the kidneys. Um, so we'll go through it. And then um, in this answer, in um, as part of the explanation, it also details out um, what each of the kind of incorrect toxicities, what they are associated with. Again, this is a way to really maximize your learning from doing questions because you can see that okay, I, I know that cisplatin's dose limiting um, toxicity is nephrotoxicity, but I can't quite remember what cardiotoxicity um, is associated with. This is a great way to kind of refresh your memory on those things as well. Okay, and so cisplatin is the P in BEP because um, it's a platinum-based um, chemotherapy um, agent. Um, we use it a lot in GYN cancers. Um, and nephrotoxicity is the dose, is the main dose-limiting side effect. Um, 
And so um, patients are hydrated before and during um, the drug administration. You also have um, ototoxicity and neurotoxicity um, that's associated with cisplatin, as well as um, electrolyte abnormalities and then um, severe nausea and vomiting. So um, because cisplatin um, is a medication that we use so commonly in OBGYN in terms of um, GYN cancers, it is worthwhile to at least remember the top three kind of causes, um, unique things about cisplatin um, in relation to its toxicity. So a good point here is that, okay, um, cisplatin is the dose limiting um, side effect um, is nephrotoxicity, but then also remember the autotoxicity and the neurotoxicity. Um, because what if this question um, didn't have nephrotoxicity, but instead had ototoxicity, um, which, you know, may not be the, um, the most common dose limiting effect, but it is a dose limiting effect. Um, and so if this question was worded slightly different, um, what is a common um, and potentially dose limiting effect of cisplatin and nephrotoxicity was not there, but instead of it was ototoxicity by remembering um, the top three kind of unique side effects of cisplatin, you can also still get the answer correct. Okay, and then cardiotoxicity, doxorubicin. Remember again from your chemo man or chemo woman um, having, um, or chemo person rather, having the D um, in place of the heart as you draw that out. Um, hemorrhagic cystitis um, being um, associated with um, cyclophosphamide is your and iphosphamide. Um, and then I love this piece here where it's also telling you um, when that uh, chemotherapy agent is, uh, is frequently used. So your cyclophosphamide is the C in Emico. Um, and then uh, you can use um, hydration here, but then also mesna for hemorrhagic cystitis prevention. Um, for pulmonary toxicity, bleomycin, the B of your chemo person's lungs, um, and this is the B in BEP. And then um, secondary leukemia or myelo and myelosuppression is etoposide. Um, and so here you have your bottom line. So going over um, the common uh, toxicities of cisplatin, but then also True Learn's insights um, will be on questions that are super high yield. So um, as we talked about, memorizing key toxicities for drugs can be really easy points on test day. Um, and that is something that for me, I always turned things that were just pretty much memorization if I hadn't seen a patient with it, for example, um, and I would just turn that into flashcards. Um, and yeah, I highly, highly recommend that. Um, and we can chat a little bit about that as well. Okay, and then the next one, um, last question, and then um, we'll uh, hopefully have about um, 10 minutes just to chat and answer your questions, okay? Um, so a 21-year-old Nala Gravita woman presents to the office four weeks after placement of a levonorgestrel IUD for follow-up. Um, after replacing, after placing the speculum, the strings of the IUD are not visible and are unable to be teased out of the cervix using a cytobrush. A pelvic ultrasound is performed and the IUD is not seen in the uterine cavity. What is the best, what is the next best step in management? What do y'all think? Give everybody a couple more seconds before we dive into the votes. And it looks like we have one for A. Okay. All right. Any anyone else?
We got one more for E. Okay, one second. We got two more for E. Okay, great. Great, great, great. I see it now. Perfect. E. All right. And so it goes through Y, E. And I, um, I'm, one second, I'm going to see if I can. I love these, um, these schematics of how to approach it. Um, and we'll kind of go through this. I think this is really great. So, um, and we'll kind of wrap, uh, go through this question here or the um, explanation. So um, it gives you a few um, background information kind of on what your LARCs are. Um, and then, um, you know, kind of your string visit um, in terms of, uh, if it's not visualized, I love that this, um, question prompt also includes that you would use a cyto brush, which is 100% what you would do, um, because that's what, uh, you know, you're in the office, you have your pat brush there, um, you tease it out, and if you're not seeing it, um, you would do an ultrasound. Um, so it's really starting with things that are um, kind of in your office. So most offices have um, have an ultrasound of some sort. So you can do a visual, you can visualize that or send someone um, for a formal uh, ultrasound. Um, and then in terms of thinking about um, complications with IUD placement, it's um, they're typically uncommon, um, but do include expulsion, perforation, and method failure. Um, expulsion is about 2 to 10% during the first year. Of course, this is a little bit higher um, in someone who, for example, is postpartum um, and has an IUD place post placental. Um, and again, this in this prompt here, it kind of lets you know this is a null I grab it at person. Um, so you have an idea at least of like um, that this wasn't placed uh, in someone who is postpartum or post um, post placental IUD. Um, and then that perforation is rare, occurs about 1.4 per 1,000 um, levonorgestrel IUD insertions and about 1.1 for the copper IUD. Um, and then if ultrasound fails to visualize, you should get um, and you should get a radiograph as your next best step. Um, and so uh, because that will give you the information that you need. Um, I, I know that there were um, a few people that said A, and even on here, you can see about 9.6% of people said A, um, but the next best step is to do um, a radiograph versus a CT. Um, just in terms of um, one, the ease of the test, how quick the test is, and then overall also that um, there's also the cost of the test as well in terms of um, a CT will, yes, tell you that information, but the um, but so will the x-ray, um, your radiograph, and it also will have less cost overall um, with the same information um, that you would need. Um, and so this kind of walks you through um, what to do if it's a if you don't see an IUD string um, and you've done your cyto brush sweep, you still don't see it. You want to rule out pregnancy. Um, give someone uh, emergency contraception if indicated. Uh, you want them to use a backup method until the IUD is confirmed in the uterus. Get a pelvic ultrasound. If it's visualized, you're done. If it's not, obtain an x-ray um, of the abdomen and pelvis. Um, if it's visualized on the, um, on the x-ray, uh, then, you know, then you know that there's a perforation um, and then you would do a laparoscopy to remove it. Um, and I've been in these clinical situations where we've, you know, removed the IUD laparoscopically and then also under um, ultrasound, sorry, under laparoscopic visualization, then replace the IUD um, during the same case. Um, uh, and then um, if it's not visualized on your IUD, on the x-ray, then you know it's not in the uterus, it's not in the abdomen, so it's likely expelled, okay? 
All right. And then here you have your bottom line again um, here. And it also goes over um, where uh, where you can find this information. Um, and I love that there's always a good chunk here for you to kind of take a deeper dive in terms of learning. So I'm going to stop sharing. Um, and then we can just chat. Um, please put in your questions. I know some folks had already sent in questions. Um, Marissa, I don't know if you want to post those and start there. Yeah, so we had a lot of questions come through and, you know, a lot of them were around, you know, as we know, the Creog is coming up. Um, so people are trying to figure out and pick your brain about what are the best recommendations that you have for last minute study tips? All right. So um, I always broke it down to what things I had seen and felt comfortable with clinically versus what I hadn't yet seen or hadn't seen recently enough to the exam. So, um, and like each year. So, um, and I'll kind of walk you through that and what I mean. Um, so if I, I remember my fourth year um, with COVID and everything, I didn't have a lot of, um, I didn't have my continuity clinic as much. And so, um, I really needed to brush up on office OBGYN um, because I was, you know, I was operating a lot. So I was seeing a lot of GYN, a lot of, um, and also did, had already done my GYN oncology rotation. So really started with the office, um, office section and focused on there, um, focused on that, and then did a lot of the general consideration. So the CREA kind of buckets when you get your CREA score is broken into general considerations, obstetrics, gynecology, and then office. Um, and office really contains so much um, in terms of, uh, you know, office contains a lot of um, primary care information as well. So how you um, how you follow someone throughout their lifespan um, in terms of um, testing that you have to do for healthcare maintenance um, and then common common things that people have, such as asthma, um, you know, bone health. Um, and things of that nature. And actually before every single CREOGS, like the morning before, um, I things that I reviewed and like had to have fresh in my mind. So as soon as I sat down and got my piece of paper, I could like write it out. I always had to look back at the biostats. So um, that's under more like general considerations. And so that's your sensitivity, specificity, how to calculate relative risk, absolute risk, things of that nature. So I would just memorize those and write it down and be ready to go. So I had it on my, um, so I had it fresh in my mind and I could just write it down on my, um, on my piece of paper for the exam. And then, um, and then I also would do the same thing with the asthma step ups, um, because then you've that's like fresh in your mind. I feel like those are not things that I was necessarily thinking about regularly in residency. And so it was always like a nice way to get a quick reminder in. Um, and then if you are have if you've already taken the CREOGS, um, your your scores are there and so and they send out kind of what you they sent out your topics and you know um where you scored stronger or where you weren't as strong and so focus on the areas that um you know have more room for improvement um it is uncomfortable for sure to kind of start with questions that uh, to start with questions that you know you don't know as well, um, but it'll definitely make an improvement on your overall test score um, because, you know, it definitely feels better to do questions in areas that you feel stronger in and that you're more interested in. Um, but in terms of improving your score, start with the um, start with the subjects that you haven't seen regularly or you haven't seen yet, um, or places that you know are just not as strong for you. Um, 
And so for me, I'm a maternal fetal medicine fellow. And so I love obstetrics. Um, and throughout the year in terms of like research and things like that, like obstetrics was something that I was reading more often. And so whenever I started studying after office, like I went right to gynecology. So I always started on either office questions or gynecology questions, just because like, one, I knew from like creox before, you know, that obstetrics was like a stronger point for me. Um, and in terms of improving my overall score, um, and then also preparing myself for written boards, really focusing on gynecology and office made a huge difference um, in terms of um, my test score. Um, and as someone who um, utilized TrueLearn, um, in my third year, that's when I used it for the first time. It made a huge difference in my test score. I went up 30 points and I'm not joking, like literally 30 point difference between my second and third year um, because of these questions. And so I, um, I really stand by it. Um, and it's why um, we wanted to be able to give away a free 30 day subscription today, um, because I think that one, I think access to these resources is just so important um, for everyone to have. And I also recognize that and as someone who does not come from a background of doc, you know, I'm the first doctor in my family and definitely don't come from a family of like a lot of um, kind of uh, financial means and um, you know, doing things like this definitely is really important to me to um, help create more access. Um, and uh, I think Marissa has also shared um, in the chat um, that we also are, you know, A to Z Medical Excellence Scholarship has partnered with Truler and Perfect. Thank you, uh, Marissa, um, uh, to really create um a good discount um, for for residents in terms of CREOX and um, board um, question banks through TrueLearn. So I hope that that has an impact for y'all. Um, you know, because this is this is my way of one um, really kind of pushing um, for more equitable access to these resources that um, that I know made a really huge difference for me. Awesome. I know we're coming up really fast on time. So we'll dive into one more really quickly. It's okay. a more specific question. So the one that came through, they wanted to know, is it more worthwhile to study bread and butter OBGYN or is it better to review the specifics of the different subsidiaries? Yeah. So um, the subspecialties um, outside of um, outside of MFM, for example, all really um, and I guess family planning kind of takes um, covers both OB and GYN, but there's a lot of GYN um, in terms of your SERP specialty. So um, I would say uh, I think bread and butter, bread and butter OBGYN for sure is what you'll be tested on um, because the the goal of CREOGS is to one, see how you're progressing throughout your um, residency um, knowledge base, but also um, it's it's to give an estimate in terms of preparedness for your written boards. Um, and those tests are geared towards what a general OBGYN has to know. And so um, not really, you don't have to go into the detail of each subspecialty to the granular level, but knowing um, the information um, that a generalist would need to know before they would make that referral. Um, so being aware of, um, of how to manage uh, preterm labor, how to manage PPROM, how to manage someone, um, you know, an abnormal pap smear, things like that. You wouldn't be expected to know in great detail the intricacies of how to um, manage cervical cancer to the extent of a GYN oncologist, but knowing the general principles of managing um, cervical cancer that a general OBGYN would have to know.